Welcome to Southwest Florida Real Estate Update. Hosted by area realtor Jim York and York Real Estate Group of Downing Fry Realty. Our show will bring you the most up-to-date information about the local real estate market featuring leading experts in the real estate field. Good afternoon and welcome to the Southwest Florida Real Estate Update. I'm Michael York with the York Real Estate Group and I'm joined today by our host Jim York and his guest Karen Kohler, President at Access Title Agency. Thank you, Michael, uh, for the introduction. Karen, welcome to the show today. I know we got a big topic to talk about, uh, new Dodd-Frank uh, closing disclosures that were going to be implemented August 1st, I take it? That is correct. Thank you for having me here, Jim. You're welcome. How about, uh, just tell us a little bit about your company. I know you're one of the premier title companies in the area here. Thank you, yes. Our company is Access Title Agency. And we've been open here in Naples since October of 2010. Uh, my prior experience in the business has been since probably the early 90s when I started off in the title in industry. Worked in Michigan for 22 years and then moved down with my husband and we opened up Access Title. And where are you located? We're located right on 41. Our address is 4081 Tamiami Trail. We're located in the Alexander's Restaurant Complex. Exactly. Great That's location. It's a great restaurant, too. Yeah. So uh, why don't you just tell us about what, to start with August 1st, what kind of changes do we expect with the Dodd-Frank uh, sure. changes? Maybe well, start with the name first. Right. We have the um, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Integrated Disclosure Ruling, which is coming into place. It's actually one of the last rollouts underneath the Frank Dodd implementation. And so be, starting August 1st, all of our mortgages and financed transactions will be seeing some of these big changes. Um, any loan application beginning August 1st and later will be subject to these regulations. The whole reason for the implementation was to make the process more streamlined for the consumer and also to um, provide them with more disclosure than we have in the past. One of the main implementations of this ruling is to make sure that the consumer receives the closing disclosure form three days prior to the closing. And uh, just only affects people that are obtaining a mortgage, right? That is correct. It is for transactions that are being financed, but there are some exceptions to that. Um, when you ask about financing, our cash transactions, of which we have so many of here in Naples, right. will not be impacted by this. It strictly is for mortgage financing. And what people are exempt from it? Underneath the size of cash people. Correct. Underneath the current exemptions, if someone is obtaining a home equity line of credit, then that would be exempt, as well as a few others, such as commercial transactions, mobile home financing, and also for private lenders who do fewer than five loans in any calendar year. Okay, and then let's just maybe talk about the uh, disclosures, which disclosures are going to be implemented, like the loan terms, et cetera. Correct. Um, really, this is kind of a, a combination of some of our current forms that we're used to. Everyone is used to currently working with the GFE, or the Good Faith Estimate, as it's called, as well as the initial loan disclosure. Those two forms are now being combined into what is referred to as the loan estimate. And then part of the closing process, we'll see a combination of some of our current forms as well. The final truth in lending form and the current HUD-1 settlement statement will be combined into one settlement, one settlement. closing disclosure form. And how about uh, just to explain to our viewers a little bit about uh, the difference in the two statements that are going to be available now versus having it on one. Or my yes. Some lenders may still require a combined form 
which includes information for both buyer and seller. But what we anticipate is that you will see more and more segregation of those separate closing disclosure forms. In other words, all of the seller's data will appear in a form that's not available or viewed by the buyer right. side. Mm -hmm. And the same thing for the buyer. The new closing disclosure form is actually five pages long. And so their private confidential um, loan information will not be disclosed to the other side. Again, there may be some lenders that will require the combined, but I think for ease of making any possible last moment changes, you're going to see more and more title agencies and attorney's offices segregating those two forms. In a different order, are they still going to be numbered? No, the closing disclosure form will not be numbered mm -hmm. as it is now. It'll actually go to a, a format oh. or a system that our software will alphabetize any of the line item entries underneath the certain categories. Mm -hmm. And uh, how about signatures? How's that going to work? The ruling actually does not require that the forms be signed or acknowledged by the buyer or seller, but I think, again, you're going to see everyone in the business industry from the, the attorneys to the um, title agents and maybe even the lenders actually making sure that there is a signature block on there for acknowledgement of receipt. Right. How do you know, uh, is this going to affect real estate agents much or is it just on your end? You know, I think, I think the goal and the hope is that it'll be a seamless process mm -hmm. and the real estate agent will hopefully not see a whole lot. There's a lot of positives to the changes. I think what the realtors or agents will be seeing is that their buyer will be receiving documents well in advance of the closing rather than maybe two hours before closing. The disclosure requires that it is provided to the consumer three days prior to closing. In um, just kind of towards the end here a little bit on this is what, what do you think the positives are of the new changes? Because I think there are some positives. I think there are a lot of positives. I think there will be a lot of integration between um, the lender system and the settlement agent system. So I think that provides for less keystroke entries, um, streamlined processes, less closing errors because of the double entry of forms. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is that the consumer does have the right to receive that settlement statement, you know, well in advance right. of the closing. Um, and maybe you can't answer this question, maybe you can, hopefully you can, is if somebody writes a contract in July 30th the 31st, how would that affect if they're applying for a loan? If they get in that application on July 31st, so it's it'll the, still fall underneath the old rules. Okay, so it has to be the application, not the real estate Correct. contract. Okay. Correct. It's okay. the application okay. that actually drives the date. Okay. Karen, uh, we're going to take a little short break, and we're going to be right back. When picking a realtor, don't just pick anyone. Pick someone with experience. Pick someone with a proven track record. Pick a realtor like Jim York from Downing Fry Realty, the number one brokerage with the most real estate transactions in the area. My husband and I had very specific ideas about what we wanted in our new home. Jim York was able to help us find the home that was ideal for us. With over 20 years of real estate experience in Southwest Florida, Jim York has negotiated over $200 million in sales contracts. Selecting the right realtor is a critical decision that can earn you thousands when selling or save you thousands when buying. Jim also helped us with a mortgage lender and a good real estate attorney. He went that extra mile and his experience says it all. Call Jim York for a no-obligation meeting at 239-273-6727 or visit his website, www.NaplesYorkRealEstate.com. Welcome back. Uh, Karen, let's, uh, let's go on a little bit. How, what kind of, do they have to have an owner's policy? No, actually the new regulation um, indicates that the closing disclosure form will actually have an area right on it where it says the owner's policy is optional. And of course, that raises a whole bunch of concern. Uh, right. You know, it, it's the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and they're actually letting the consumer know that 
the owner's policy of title insurance, which affords them coverage, is optional. The other concern, of course, is that the consumer won't have the protection, and many of us in the closing industry may actually have disclosure forms right at the table that if, in fact, a consumer or buyer decides or elects not to get that coverage underneath the owner's policy, they will need to sign off on a waiver of disclosure that they opted out. The second concern with that is, as you know, our rates here for issuing an owner's policy and a loan policy in conjunction together, that the loan policy receives a simultaneous issue credit, which substantially brings down that title premium. Right. If they're not opting for an owner's policy, then underneath our filed rates, that loan policy premium would need to go up. So the concern is, is that, that that may happen late in the game. Um, so I think it's important to um, educate you know, our agents and mm -hmm. realtors and consumers as to why an owner's policy you know, affords them right. the protection that they need. But I thought that with getting a mortgage, you have to get an owner's policy. With Most getting a mortgage, right. you have to have a mortgage policy. Right. And the mortgage policy does Covers not just, insure the, right. the buyer or consumer. Right. It actually insures the, the lender. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. How about um, the rescission period, the different three days? Um, during the three days, right. initially the ruling was that there would not be any um, options for any revisions Ch or revision. changes okay. during that three business day period. Otherwise, the consumer would need to have the information or the um, closing disclosure, you know, resent out to them so mm -hmm. that they had enough time to review it. And in one of the final rulings here, they actually indicated that they would allow for changes up to the day of closing. Right with the exception of three things, and that would be if the annual percentage rate changed, or if the lender added a prepayment penalty, or the third item would be if the um, lender had to change the loan product at the last moment. Okay, and how's this affected in the other 21 states that's mentioned in here? Yes, there's, there's 21 states that currently have an issue with how the CFPB is having us disclose the title premium charges. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's states that have um, rates set by the um, state itself, such as ours, right. or sometimes in states because of the simultaneous issue rate. It's causing discrepancies and having us disclose title premiums that are against, you know, our state filing. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, Michigan, I know, is actually one of the states that is also having an issue with it. And it's my understanding that the underwriters in that state, who are allowed to file with the state commission to make changes, are just going to the state and having those rates changed. Here in Florida, it's, it's a different game, um, and, and no one has determined how we're going to adjust for those changes that they're having us make in disagreement with our state ruling. Okay, and uh, okay, so we have the banks, the big mortgage companies here. How does this affect the private lender? Uh, private lenders actually need to follow the same regulation. Um, you know, our community banks will all be on board with this. Um, everyone is getting um, into place some integrated systems so that we can work together, but they will actually fall underneath the same ruling. Okay, well, uh, I think we've beat that bush enough, right? I <laughs> so, think we have. Okay, We'll so, continue to do it until August 1st. I'm too. sure there will be. So um, uh, let's just go into closing cost and sure. how it's how uh, our viewers can understand, because a lot of them are from up north. So uh, right. um, you know, I know they get confused or they're shocked by maybe the cost of uh, closing cost here versus up yes. north. So let's just step them through it. You know, in the contract, um, you know, certain in Collier County, the buyer pays the title insurance. So maybe we could just walk them through shortly the Some different the ste the steps and the fees that sure. go along with a closing, sure. a standard closing. 
A standard closing using our Board of Realtor contract here does call in Collier County for the buyer to pay for all of the title costs, which is substantially different from a lot of the other states, especially up north. Um, that fee, of course, is collected for the title premium for the owner's policy. Mm -hmm. If they're obtaining a loan policy, they're also paying for a uh, title premium to ensure that lender's enforceability of that loan. Uh, the closing fee is typically split equally between the buyer and the seller. The seller is going to pay most often the dock stamps that are collected based on the purchase price. And what rate is that? The dock stamps on the deed mm -hmm. normally assessed to the seller are based on 70 cents per hundred dollars. Right. So for example, if you had a $500,000 sale transaction, mm -hmm. your seller would be assessed $2,800 for that. Right. And, and not to interrupt you there, so how's that compared to the cost of title insurance? How does that compare? What's the rate for title insurance? The rate for title insurance is going to be pretty close to that rate mm -hmm. when you're in that price point that you're talking okay. about. Um, add to it a lender's policy, you know, you're right in that same neighborhood. Same so it's about the same. Correct. Okay. Yep. And then uh, let's just go into prorations, okay, you know, taxes and HO, Homeowners sure. Association. You At closing, we would normally prorate the real estate taxes. Mm -hmm. And those are most often going to be prorated based on the base amount. In other words, as you know, down here in Florida, the real estate taxes come out in November. And the county tax collector will give you a discount for each month that you pay early. Well, we are prorating those real estate taxes on the base amount without the discount. So you take a look at the month of March, what it would be, and that's what we prorate our taxes on. Now there may be non ad valerium taxes or perhaps a CDD included right. in that. That is actually stripped out from the total tax bill. Mm -hmm. It's also prorated, but it's prorated differently. It's prorated through the end of September as if the seller has paid that portion in advance. Okay. And maybe you could explain to our viewers about what a stop a letter is. An estoppel letter is something that we are required to um, obtain from either the association, if they're self-managed, or from the property management company. We see quite a variance of rates. Um, sometimes the estoppel letters, they will charge $100, and sometimes we see them upwards of 500 and some dollars. That fee um, is normally advanced by us prior to closing, although there is some pending litigation or legislation, excuse me, that may change that where the fees will be collected through the closing and then the settlement agent will not need to advance those fees. Jim, basically what that estoppel letter does is it gives us our guidance of what the association due status is, right. whether or not the seller is paid current or if um, you know there's dues that are, are actually owed. Mm -hmm. It'll also give us the guidance whether they're a monthly fee, a quarterly fee, or an annual fee. Sometimes there's a, a resale fee that's assessed, so it really kind of gives us our direction of how to place things and prorate them on the closing statement. Okay. Finally here, I'd like to just explain to our viewers, because some people don't know what this is, okay, is what is title insurance? Because I've had lots of people ask me that uh, over the years. Not, not that many, but at least, sure. you know, we could explain to them what it, how it protects them. Sure. Title insurance is unlike other forms of insurance, mm -hmm. rather than loss prevention, I guess you could say it's more of a risk prevention. Right. And it ensures that they have clear marketable title to the property, that there are no outstanding other interests or, you know, heirs mm -hmm. from an estate or probate that could come forward and make a claim against the property. Sometimes it's making sure that we've um, researched the back title to the property, um, making sure that there's no missing deeds, no imperfections in the legal descriptions, 
We're also making sure that any liens, mortgages, or encumbrances are found and identified. Um, and so that's, that's really what it is. In the event that you would suffer a loss down the road, right. um, it, protects, they, it, it steps would. in and protects the consumer. Right. The other thing, a lot of people will not want to pay that fee for the owner's policy. Right. And it really protects everyone in the transaction. They have to think about down the road when they go to sell the property, they're going to be asked to sign on a warranty deed where they are actually warranting title to the property and the defense of it. And so this insurance is a one-time premium Right. and really gives them a lot of protection, especially with the value of the real estate in our market. And how long uh, till they get that policy in the mail afterwards? Normally it could take up to six weeks. What we do in our office is we send in our recordings, mm -hmm. we wait for the clerk's office to do the filing and indexing of the documents, and then they return the original deed and mortgage certificates of approval to our office. We then, within about three weeks of closing, are mailing out those originals to either the, the buyer or the lender, whatever right. the form is, and then we request a policy to be put together. So I would estimate a four to six week time period for that policy. Okay, well, uh, Karen, we're going to take a little short break here and we're going to be right back. Selecting the right realtor is a critical decision that can earn you thousands when selling. Jim sold our villa in just two days. We got the highest price in the community. He then helped us to negotiate and purchase our new home here in Tiburon. I'd recommend Jim. His expertise made all the difference. Call Jim York for a no obligation meeting at 239-273-6727 or visit his website, www.naplesyorkrealestate.com. Welcome back. Uh, Karen, we're gonna go to a question from Michael right now. Karen, could you help our audience understand about the deposit process and what happens to their money once an offer is accepted? Michael, great question. Your customer's deposits, once the contract is signed, are actually submitted to our office. Sometimes we receive those deposits via wire transfer, which is the preferred method, or sometimes they are delivered to our office those checks are immediately processed and put into our insured escrow account with our local um, banks. We then are required to send out the deposit verification form, which is the form that indicates we are acknowledging that we're in receipt and are holding those monies and that the contract is actually fully executed and, and binding. So that leads me to one other question. Okay, so. Uh, for closing, you do not accept checks or certified checks. Just that explain that part of it, maybe. That is correct. In recent years, our underwriters have required that we accept good funds in every instance possible and utilize the receiving of wire transfers. The reason for that, and many consumers are a little frustrated because they want to walk in with certified funds or um, a certified check or a money order made payable to, to us. Right. The reason why that's not acceptable is because there has been so much fraud in recent years and some of those checks have been forged and they're not good funds as they used to be in the old days when right. we did business. It used to be cash in hand when you received a certified check. That is no longer the case. In fact, many banks are actually placing holes on certified checks and money orders. So we need to make sure that we have funds that are immediately accessible because we are dispersing to everyone. Well, Karen, I appreciate you coming this evening here and talking and helping our viewers and helping us understand the new rules and, and really closing costs also. And uh, I'll continue to do business with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim.